Well, for many people, their experience with AI has been self-scanning groceries at the supermarket or playing around with ChatGPT at home. But advances in artificial intelligence are moving ahead at lightning speed. Some say AI is the next best thing. Others say it's even bigger than that. It's going to change everything and perhaps even transform what it means to be human. And while some salivate at the possibilities, others, like former Google boss Eric Schmidt, have warned that AI could destroy the world. So... Which is it? Joining me now is futurist Mel Fletcher. Mel, are we going to see robots taking over the world? Is it going to be like a Blade Runner-esque kind of future? Just what can we expect from AI? Hi, James. Good to be with you. Um, look, I think a lot of the fear that we see about AI, we're right to be cautious, but the fear that some people express is down to misunderstanding some of the terms we use. For example, AI refers, at least at this point in time, to narrow intelligence. It's good at carrying out complex single-level tasks, like winning a game of chess, but it's not so good at dealing with multiple-level tasks simultaneously in the way that the brain does every day. So for the moment, at least, we're well short of what technologists call artificial general intelligence, which is where a machine can do almost anything a human can do. Now, the speed is picking up, the speed of development, so we need to be careful. And the next big AI might be trained on mathematics and visual patterns, which means it could become logical in its thinking, more meaningful in its conversations with us. But we're still the ones that uh, have the moral choice at this point. Sorry, you just said two things there that got my attention. You said that uh, AI robots could become more logical and they could engage in more, did you say, meaningful conversation? How do we get to a point where robots have logic and that they can communicate with meaning? Well, the meaning question is a big one, and we might come to the subject of consciousness uh, in a moment, if you like. But AI represents a value-neutral intelligence. Machines are amoral, so we're the ones who make the ethical choices. Um, and as the tech develops, our ethical role is going to become more important. So when it comes to issues like meaning and fluid conversations with machines, some tech pioneers are worried that these things will develop under their own steam in ways we can't understand or control, but we're nowhere near that yet. And that's why I'm advocating we need to start having wide-ranging debates, uh, cast the net wider than just politicians and technologists, and start involving people like engineers, biologists, uh, medical experts, people in ethics, even theology. If we're going to create AI that benefits humanity, we need to first understand what it truly means to be human. And we all need to move beyond simply trusting tech, James. We need to start asking questions about what are the ethical things to do with these techs and how can we apply that in any given situation? I want to come back to those questions in a moment, but let me talk to you about this. Um, AI is currently being used to bring musicians back to life. Elvis Presley died 66 years ago, but he's got a new stage show starting in November performing as a hologram, which raises the question, if you attend, can you say you've seen Elvis perform or not? I doubt it. I mean, the avatars here in London, you can't really see, say you've seen ABBA just because you've seen holograms uh, presented. I think AI will keep surprising us in the arts and in everyday life, and there's a lot of benefits to it. You know, that in education, in the same way that we would go to concerts, we might see immersive learning experiences. Learning a language could become a fully immersive experience rather than a piecemeal thing in a, in a classroom. Imagine studying historical events by being able to visit them in virtual space. If you combine virtual reality with AI, it will make that possible in real time. And healthcare, you know, with great developments at the moment with nanobots, microscopic machines built from the atomic level up from cellular material that can, at least in theory, be loaded with chemicals injected into the bloodstream and take out harmful cells like cancer while leaving the, the healthy cells intact. So there's a lot to be said about the immersiveness of AI, but it's not all for the arts. Uh, sticking with the arts for a minute, Anna Indiana is an AI-generated singer-songwriter. Would you believe with thousands of followers on social media, uh, I'm saying she, I'm not sure what pronouns you use for a robot, but Anna released this song last year. It was described as soulless. Have, have a listen. Sitting at my favourite cafe Sipping my tea It's Saturday Thinking about
Mel, it doesn't exactly move you, does it? But uh, isn't that the problem with AI and music? Music is more than mathematical. It comes from the heart. And AI doesn't fall in love or doesn't suffer heartbreak. So it's only ever going to be elevator music. Am I right? Well, it might be more than elevator music, James, but it's one of the, you're right, one of the great limitations of AI. The one human skill machines can't master is empathy because that requires a shared human experience, something by definition a machine can't have. So AI might be able to fake empathy through social bots and the like, but we still know it's not the real thing. And there are times when we need the real thing. I think in the arts, um, we'll come to appreciate the work of human creatives much more in the age of AI. Um, at the moment, let's face it, most AI-generated art like that clip is curated by human beings. It's created using a back-and-forth sequence of program instructions that provide the guidelines for the overall work. And I can see a time in the near future where artists will use AI as a collaborative force in the same way that, say, Michelangelo and da Vinci did with their apprentices during the Renaissance. So you know, technology on its own won't be able to empathise with the human condition, and that, after all, is the basis of great art. What about the potential for AI to be used to cause political chaos? I'm thinking of deep fakes. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin recently did an interview with an AI-generated version of himself. Check this out. Здравствуйте. Я студент и учусь в Санкт-Петербургском государственном университете. Хочу спросить, правда ли, что у вас много двойников? И еще, как вы относитесь к тем опасностям, которые несет в нашу жизнь искусственный интеллект и нейросети? Спасибо. Не представился. Now, we've got important elections in the US and the UK this year, with the entire world getting their news online. The rise of deep fakes is a huge problem, isn't it? How do we know what's real and what's not in the future? Well, until recently, James, there were ways we could actually train people, and we did it, to identify a deep fake using the naked eye. But AI, as you say, is becoming more sophisticated all the time. Um, so, first of all, we, we will need to use AI itself to help identify material produced by other AI. <laughs> uh, there are things called embedded watermarks, hidden patterns inside a text or pictures that are invisible to the human eye but detectable by computer algorithms. And there are other ways that tech can help us too, but we can't rely completely on them, so we'll need to keep ourselves very well informed on current affairs so that we know the overall direction a story is already taking and um, we can make sure we read from more than one source, for example. We can be watchful for conspiracy theories that offer these uh, very simplistic, sinister scenarios to explain very complex situations. So no means of IDing deep fakes will ever be foolproof. But at the end of the day, we all need to stay alert. Absolutely. And watch Sky News. Mel Fletcher, thank you very much for your time. It's great talking to you.